friends, I am Dr. Harvinder Singh and today we are going to discuss this very, very clinically relevant topic of using psychotropics with comorbid medical conditions. And in this short video, we will only focus on antidepressant. As you know, I posted this question. Um, so very briefly, I will um, read this. So this is a 75 year old female with following medical conditions, hypertension, but it needed two antihypertensive to control it, insulin dependent diabetes, high body mass index, BMI of 38, stage three chronic kidney disease um, uh, with EGFR of 35, which puts her in a moderate um, renal failure, history of congestive heart failure, and EKG was done, which revealed QTC of 475 millisecond. So let's understand um, how we can choose uh, the best antidepressant. But be mindful, there is no one right answer here. We need to just try to rule out the wrong or harmful antidepressants here. So this is how I'm going to discuss it in various classes of antidepressant, SSRIs, which are only selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. SNRIs are serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Then we have NDRI, which is norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitors. Then this is sertraline, uh, mo serotonin modulators. And then we have tricyclic antidepressants and monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So in this patient, uh, let's uh, uh, try to start with renal impairment first. So we know this patient's GFR is, EGFR is 35, and that puts her in a moderate renal impairment range, which is between 30 to 59, as we know. So going by each SSRI first, but also be mindful that she is... Um, uh, a geriatric older patient, so most of the dosing should be on a lower side if possible. So fluoxetine is our first medication that we can choose. Uh, you can start at 20 milligram or 10 milligram if needed. And we know that fluoxetine does not need any dosage adjustment with renal impairment. So this is a good option. Peroxetine is also an option uh, at a low dose of 10 milligram per day. And please note that I'm only talking from renal impairment standpoint right now. So paroxetine, uh, mostly when GFR goes below 30, then you need to start at a low dose. Her is around 35, so still we need to be very cautious here because we don't want this GFR trending down. And then we have sertraline. Uh, 50 milligram per day, but mostly I start at 25 milligram per day in geriatric population. And um, the guideline tells us between 30 to uh, more than 30 uh, uh, of GFR, you don't do any adjustment. Mostly when the GFR goes below 30, then you do slow increase in sertraline dosing. And then we have citalopram uh, again, um, only dosage impair, uh, adjustment is needed with severe renal impairment, not with mild or moderate. So nothing will be needed in this patient. And then we have escitalopram, same issues, uh, more than 30 of GFR, no dosage adjustment is needed. But if the uh, GFR goes below 30, then you need to start at a low dose of 10 milligram. You can definitely start 20, but again, I always start on a lower side to assess how a person is doing and then we titrate gradually. Uh, for the sake of completion, I have included fluvoxamine here. We all know fluvoxamine is only approved for OCD uh, spectrum uh, management, not for MDD, which is major depressive disorder. But uh, fluvoxamine is one of the SSRI which does not need any dosage adjustment with renal impairment. So you can start at either 50 or 100 milligram at bedtime and titrate gradually. So these are the SSRI, which are likely options based on the GFR of this patient. Now going to SNRI class, and we will start with venlafaxine. Again, no dosage adjustment is needed if GFR is above 30. You, you should start at 37.5 if the GFR goes below 35. 
Moving to Desvenla vaccine, uh, again, a no dosage adjustment is needed uh, as GFR is above 30. But if it go, drops below 30, you need to dose it every other day. Uh, moving on to duloxetine, um, uh, same thing. If it is more than 30, no dosage adjustment is needed. But if GFR drops below 30, you need to avoid it. Uh, so this is one of the caution with duloxetine. They are very strictly mentioned in package insert to avoid this in severe renal impairment, which is below 30 of GFR. And this patient's GFR is very close to that, so I will be very cautious with this option. And then moving on to levomildacipran, which is also approved for MDD. And here, uh, you can start this medication at 20 milligram per day, but the limitations are at the highest dose. So between 30 to 60 of GFR, you should not exceed 80 milligram per day. And as soon as GFR drops below 30, you should not exceed 40 milligram per day uh, in a range, dosing range. So these were SNRI class. Now moving on to NDRI and bupropion is the only medication here. So um, here you will start the patient on 150 milligram per daily. And this is the same dosing for each decline in GFR, even less than one, less than 15 of GF, EGFR, you start at 150 milligram per day. But mostly I aim for lower doses in geriatric population if I have to choose this medication. Now, moving on to sertraline modulator, uh, the mirtazapine, you will start this at 15 milligram per day. Um, you, the only issue here is with GFR between um, less than 60 um, or less than 30, I should say, you increase it very, very carefully. That is the main issue with mirtazapine. And then trazodone, uh, very commonly used medication, no dosage adjustment is needed um, till um, it's more than 15, one five uh, ml per minute of eGFR. Um, but if once the GFR drops below 15, then you increase it very carefully. Uh, so no dosage adjustment is needed Package insert actually mentions 150 milligram per daily starting dose for trazodone, but we already know, we, most of us actually start at low dose to cause excessive sedation, uh, especially in a geriatric population. And then we have velazidone. No dosage adjustment is needed with any of the EGFR decline. So you can start at 10 milligram per daily, and then in a few days you can go to 20 and use that uh, titration schedule that we use for velazidone in adult population. And then we have vortioxetine, same thing, no dosage adju adjustment is needed with any of the EGFR decline here. And uh, I have not mentioned nifazidone here, um, but we're one of the good medication which is not available in United States at this time, but uh, you can um, start at 100 milligram per daily for nifazidone also. Uh, the only issue is once the GFR you know, starts dropping, the increase in dosage for nifazidone should be very, very cautiously done. And the last class is tricyclic antidepressants and MAOIs. I have mentioned most of the common names, but uh, the issue is we all know in geriatric population, we should uh, not consider uh, these medication tricyclics because of their side effect profile, risk of toxicity, drug interactions with other medication, and, and many other side effects. And monoamine oxidase inhibitors are not first line treatment, they are mostly for treatment resistant depression. And in this patient, we are aiming for you know first line treatment at this time. And going by same rule among SSRI, paroxetine is one medication I will recommend not to choose as first line, especially in geriatric population because of the anticholinergic, risk of fall, cardiac side effects, and drug interactions with the medication that this patient must be taking for medical condition. And fluvoxamine is not approved for MDD treatment, mostly for OCD or um, OCD spectrum disorder right now. So at this time, we are left with these medication. Let me move everything uh, to a little bigger uh, one so that every medication is visible. So friends, this was the first part uh, of uh, medication options based on the renal impairment. And if you're interested, we have this chapter in our course, 
antidepressant use with renal impairment. This is the first chapter in the course, which is available for a free preview. I will put all the links below. Please click on them and read the chapter, but let's move forward. So the so EGFR was one thing in this patient, right? The second thing was patient also have diabetes, insulin dependent diabetes and body mass index of 38 right now. So based on that, which medication we can remove from here? Well, mirtazapine is one medication I will be cautious because we know the weight gain potential from mirtazapine thereby causing the metabolic side effect. So that won't be uh, my first choice here based on patient already struggling with this much uh, BMI and is on insulin for diabetes. All other medications are comparatively safer compared to mirtazapine, I will say. So let's remove mirtazapine there. And the next medical condition is hypertension. Mostly, um, um, I don't worry about hypertension much, but if a patient need two or more of the antihypertensives to control their blood pressure, I mostly try to avoid the SNRI class here. We all know uh, how uh, most of them have risk of causing uh, hypertension, even in people who don't have hypertension because of the noradrenergic effect there. Uh, but on the other hand, when lafaxine, we know at 75 milligram per day, it's more serotonergic. Once you go to 150, it's more noradrenergic apart. Uh, but still, I will uh, try to avoid SNRI uh, unless patient is also struggling with comorbid pain condition. Then SNRI class will make more sense. But we are not going to go there. So let's remove the SNRI class at this time and we are left with this. And the next medical condition that this patient is struggling with is QTC prolongation. Uh, but before we go there, you see the QTC here is 475 millisecond. And uh, do you think this is prolonged QTC or no? Well, for adult uh, females, adult women, this is still considered borderline. Between 451 to 480 millisecond is borderline. More than 480 is prolonged. But for a geriatric patient with so much medical comorbidities, I will be very, very cautious with this uh, QTC interval. And I will treat this as a prolonged QTC and try to avoid anything that can do further prolonging of QTC. And in these medications, we know citalopram and escitalopram are actually uh, one of the risky medication. But very briefly, I will say, you know, uh, mostly the high risk antidepressants are citalopram and tricyclic antidepressants for that. And uh, the moderate risk antidepressants are escitalopram, venlafaxine, and even mirtazapine. And then all other medications are considered low risk. But if you're interested in learning more, we have a chapter on this also in our course, which is antidepressant use with cardiac risk. I'm going to put all the information below. Now, moving on. So these are the medications we are left with so far. And the last medication this patient have is congestive heart failure. And um, actually, most medications are good, but you all know this uh, trial called SAD Heart Trial. And sertraline was the best medication recommended uh, in that condition. So ideally speaking, if I have the option of choosing one medication, I will go with sertraline. But all the other medications are good candidate depending on the medical condition. Well, if somebody have had trauma seizure history, you know, I will try to avoid bupropion with that. If, uh, if my patient is struggling with many cognitive issues, you know, vortioxetine will make more sense. If a patient have history of sexual side effect on most serotonergic medication, then I will lean more toward vilazidone in those cases. So what I'm trying to say is everything depends on the medical comorbidities where the patient is coming from, past trials, family history, and many other things. So friend, this was our session for today. And if you're interested in learning more about using antidepressant with medical condition, 
please consider subscribing to our course. We have many chapters on not only antidepressant but on antipsychotic with medical comorbidities, uh, mood stabilizers with medical comorbidities, and other psychotropics used with medical comorbidities. But here for antidepressant, we have lesson on real impairment. Now, this lesson is actually available for free. I will put the link below. You can also learn about using antidepressants with hepatic impairment, which is also very important. Although this patient don't have hepatic impairment, but uh, we have very good chapter on that. And then we have a chapter on cardiac, which is QTC prolongation risk with each antidepressant. We have chapter on use of antidepressant with atrial fibrillation and use of antidepressant with hyponatremia risk. This is actually one of the common risks that most people don't realize. And then using antidepressant in patients with high prolactin level, and then antidepressants uh, used with seizure disorders, antidepressant used with restless leg syndrome, and then uh, patients with comorbid HIV AIDS or in oncology patient, transplant patient. And I have not mentioned many of the thing. We all have uh, chapters on COPD and antidepressant use and many, thing, many other chapters. So friends, if you're interested in learning more, do consider subscribing to our course, Physician's Guide for Clinical Psychiatry course. I will put the link below to learn more details about this course but we have more than 250 chapters. But not only that, you also get access to our journal club and uh, where we post, you know, journal club discussions and you get CME credits. And we also have, you will also get access to coffee club where we put our discussions with experts in the field of psychiatry, 10 minutes video that you can quickly watch and learn something in your coffee break. And there are many other things like, you know, discount on our first conference. And there are many new things that will be coming very soon. And you will be getting discounts or free access to those. But just wait for that. But I will recommend subscribing to our course. Uh, so friends, I'm Dr. Harvinder Singh. I will see you all in our next video set discussion. Bye for now. Hey.